Good afternoon, and welcome to my Friday message. First of all, it's great to be back talking to you after a brief, brief but welcome vacation. I spent some time in the North Carolina mountains with my family, and it was a wonderful reminder of how beautiful this state is and how important it is to step away and chill with those that you love. Let's start by offering a warm welcome to Dr. Suzanne Barber, who has been appointed the new Dean of Duke's Graduate School and Vice Provost for Graduate Education. Dr. Barber is joining Duke from UNC Chapel Hill and will begin her new role on September 15th. A biomedical scientist, she will hold a faculty appointment within the School of Medicine. And congratulations to Lisa McElroy in the Department of Surgery. Dr. McElroy has been named the inaugural holder of the Nequir E. Aquari MD Endowed Professorship. This professorship was created to honor the legacy of Dr. Aquari, the first African-American surgeon on the faculty of Duke University. Dr. Okwari was a highly respected surgeon and deeply committed to equitable and compassionate care of patients and to mutual respect. Dr. McElroy shares many of those same attributes and is well-deserving of this honor. So now let's move to the latest COVID news. The level of COVID infection across the U.S. continues to be quite significant. 46% of counties, districts, and territories have a, a high COVID infection community level as defined by the CDC, including Durham, and 36% of the communities have a medium infection level. The predominant variant is the Omicron variant, BA5, that has now been predominant in circulation for the last six weeks. It's important to consider what is happening locally in your personal decisions. In addition to vaccination with boosters to protect against severe disease, consider masking when in crowded indoor spaces if you're in areas where the activity is high, which is Durham right now. Very much in the news lately is the, the issue of COVID rebound, particularly following the course of the antiviral Paxlovid, as seen in two high profile leaders, President Biden and NIAID director, Anthony Fauci. So what is exactly COVID rebound? It is when a person has documented COVID infection, and in the case of Dr. Fauci and President Biden have been on Paxlovid, they have resolution of symptoms and their antigen test has converted to negative. They then have recurrence of symptoms with a positive test, usually two to eight days after clearing. It's important to note that rebound of COVID with return of symptoms and reversion back to a positive test within a few days is not uniquely seen in those treated with Paxlovid. And it's also important to note that the rebound within days is not a new infection. The frequency of COVID rebound reported in the original clinical trial data from Pfizer was about 1%. Similarly, in a more recent Mayo Clinic study in the June edition of Journal of, of Clinical Infectious Diseases, out of 483 patients at high risk treated with Paxlovid, only four experienced a recurrence of symptoms for 0.8%, and all cases were mild. However, Anecdotal reporting suggests it may be more frequent with another study showing 6% incidence. CDC issued a health alert to physicians about the potential for COVID rebound in May of this year, indicating that symptoms may return in some individuals regardless of whether they're vaccinated or treated with the antivirals. And in fact, in a preprint of a study published this week, COVID rebound with symptoms and viral load relapse was seen in the absence of any antiviral treatment in 12% of patients studied, with a higher number experienced recurrence of symptoms and a lower number, a significant rise in viral load. So the bottom line is this, in a small number of individuals, symptoms and viral testing relapse can occur within days of resolution in the presence or absence of treatment. The cause, while not completely understood, does not appear to be the evolution of resistant virus in the setting of therapy. It is likely with rebound of the virus that transmission can occur and therefore isolation is warranted. There is, however, no evidence that the rebound episode has greater associated disease. And in the case of antivirals, the role of a second course of an antiviral or a longer primary course, course is not clear, but does warrant further investigation. And for those at risk for more severe disease with COVID, I believe that the benefits of the antivirals outweighs either risk of rebound or any drug side effects, which have been mild, but include a metallic taste. As we have experienced now for two years, we are still learning more about COVID every day. 
The other infectious disease you've been hearing a lot about in the news is monkeypox. Until recently, cases were rare and predominantly found in Africa, but the current outbreak is worldwide. It is an orthopox virus related to variola, the cause of smallpox, although much less contagious and associated with much milder disease and rarely is it fatal. The first human cases were reported in the Congo in the 1970s with rare cases outside of Africa, usually associated with international travel or the, with imported animals. In contrast, the current outbreak involves a number of countries worldwide, including the US. The first cases in the US were reported in May and now are above 6,000 reported cases. Monkeypox is spread through close physical contact. And while anyone can get infected if they have direct physical contact with someone or with infected material, the current outbreak is predominantly seen in with men who have sex with men. An infected individual can spread it to others from the time that symptoms start until the rash is fully healed with the illness lasting two to four weeks. Two vaccines can be used for the prevention of monkeypox virus and the CDC and Duke are currently recommending vaccination for anyone who has had close contact in the past two weeks with someone who's been diagnosed with monkeypox. Also currently for men who have sex with men or transgender individuals who are at high risk as defined by these indicators on the screen. Duke just launched a website to share the latest information. So to stay informed, check the website prepared.duke.edu slash prepared slash monkeypox. Now let me end with some more good news. Four School of Medicine faculty were among the nine winners of the inaugural Duke Science and Technology Spark C grants. These grants recognize best-in-class research projects proposed by early to mid-career faculty. And our School of Medicine had four recipients. Please join me in congratulating these outstanding scientists on this well-deserved recognition. And in closing, I'd like to recognize and thank Jill Boy, who has served as Associate Dean and Chief Communications Director for the School of Medicine for the last 10 years and for my five years as Dean. She'll be moving on to a campus position to oversee the planning, coordination, and implementation of the comprehensive effort to mark the 100th anniversary of the founding of Duke University in 1924. Her role and accomplishments in supporting the school and all of our missions are too many to enumerate, but I would like to recognize her for the extraordinary attention she has paid to respecting everyone. At the end of the day, we do serve an extraordinary community of individuals, and Jill exemplified the commitment to service. Thank you, Jill. We will miss you. With that, thanks to everyone for all that you do every day and have a restful weekend.